PCN is brought to you in part by the following underwriters. Welcome to December and welcome to PAC TV Community News. We have a great show this week with stories from Duxbury, Kingston, Pembroke, and Plymouth. We take you to an energy forum in Pembroke, a texting and driving demonstration in Plymouth, and we learn about the family history behind the Windsor House in Duxbury. We get a preview of an upcoming radio theater show. Pet Adoption introduces us to two dogs in need of forever homes, and we hear about a new food tour on the South Shore. Get a Life with Loretta LaRoche is back with thoughts on the commercialization of the holidays. It's a full show, and we begin with a story from Burial Hill in Plymouth. The Friends of Burial Hill hosted a Civil War reenactment of the 1864 funeral of three of Plymouth's Civil War soldiers and the man who brought them home. Return of the Dead featured several community groups, including the Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Recreated and the Standish Guards Drum and Bugle Corps. PCN stopped in to see more. Well, the Friends of Burial Hill organized in 2010 um, to uh, aid in the preservation of Burial Hill, to conserve its grave markers, um, to interpret the history of those interred, and to raise awareness through education and events such as what we're putting on today, the Return of the Dead, uh, a Civil War reenactment of a funeral that occurred here in Plymouth on Burial Hill, October 21st, 1864. We're working with the Massachusetts 22nd Volunteer Infantry Militia of Reenactors and the Standish Drum and Bugle Corps to put forth a day in October of 1864. So we're reenacting the funeral um, of three of Plymouth's fallen heroes and the brave and selfless man, Sergeant Seth Patey, who brought their bodies home. Okay, I will be speaking about Sergeant Thomas Hayden. Uh, he was born in Quincy, but he did serve in the Civil War. Uh, he did die of malaria, though, in Kentucky. He is buried up here in Burial Hill. Actually, his wife is buried right beside him also. She never did remarry after Thomas died, and she did die in 1916, and she is buried right beside him also. Uh, my role in the war is, if you look at my arm, you'll see two crossed axes. I would be a pioneer, and the pioneers would be the guys that would have some mechanical expertise, they'd take down trees, they'd build the floors in the officer's tents, repair wagons. Um, a lot of times they would have to go out under fire and take down trees for the artillery, unarmed, under the protection of the snipers. It was considered to be an honor to be a, a pioneer. Pioneers basically did a lot of the, the bulwark during the war, but uh, each, each regiment was dedicated to give two pioneers, so there would be a hundred man company of pioneers with each regiment. As a reenactor, I got into this about five years ago, just at the start of the 150th cycle. I figured I'd try it out. I got hooked, I enjoyed it. Uh, it's a lot of fun for me. I enjoy the living history part of it. I, I enjoy going to the reenactments and actually seeing the enemy come up towards me and wondering, you know, is this, the same thing that these guys faced 150 years ago. And uh, mostly I enjoy the camaraderie of the camp at night and the campfire and the people I'm with. It's just a lot of fun, it's a lot of relaxation. Uh, Standish Guards Drum and Bugle Corps is a nonprofit, all age marching organization. It's open to anybody of any age, regardless of experience. We provide uniforms, training, all the instruments. And we're always looking for new people, whether they play brass, percussion, or uh, in the color guard. If you're going to the Thanksgiving Day Parade and you see the drum and bugle corps coming down the street, that's exactly what we're trying to do right here in Plymouth. Mm -hmm. Our role is to provide drumming that is very similar to what Civil War drummers would play when they would be calling troops together or issuing battlefield commands, um, or also when 
Uh, you had a brass, Civil War brass band that would play music along the way that would help boister the spirits of the troops, things like that. Keep your eyes on the road. Be aware of other drivers. Drive defensively. Expect the unexpected. Driving instructors and parents alike have been saying these things to teen drivers since the invention of the automobile. You know, back before car stereos and cellular phones. Those words have just as much meaning today as we find out firsthand how easy it is to get distracted and crash your car in the Distractology Mobile. The Distractology Mobile made its way back to the South Shore, this time stopping at Plymouth South High School. In case you missed it last time, its purpose is to show youngsters who are newly permitted or licensed up to three years the dangers of driving while distracted through a computer simulated program. Just about anything can constitute distracted driving. It's not only text messaging. It can be looking in your passenger seat for something, eating while you're driving, changing the radio station. All of these things fall under that heading of distracted driving. While the exercise is geared towards high school age drivers, there's no reason adult drivers couldn't use a good refresher course now and then. Truth told, on my way in, I was cut off by another driver who was talking on her phone in the very parking lot where this was set up. I think adults, as a parent, we need to be role models for our kids. We need to put down the phone. You're seeing people on the road and they're swerving all over and they're not paying attention. They're talking to the person beside them. They need to show their kids because we are their example. The students are given scenarios that involve much more than just talking on their phone or sending text messages. Much of it has to do with paying attention to every detail while you drive, as McGough explains. When they come up to a crosswalk, instead of just blowing by it, they really need to slow down. If their vision is impaired, they need to slow down and even stop sometimes to make sure there's no people crossing in front of them that they could injure. Oncoming traffic, which is actually a really big one, we're making them take a left-hand turn, they have a green light, but when they go over to the second lane, there is a truck coming, and a lot of them are getting hit by that. It seems like a pretty simple concept. Keep your eyes on the road and pay attention. But to show how simple it is to lose control when you're not doing these two things, I took a turn in the driver's seat. <laughs> Christina McGough gave us some sobering statistics. Nine people a day die in car accidents due to distracted driving. So it is an epidemic. It's something that we really want to teach our kids to be safer drivers, adults too. Myself, I was here all day Monday. When I walked away and I don't text and drive, was don't be distracted at all because we do have these kids on the road. They are distracted and they very new on the, on the road and you just need to be aware of what's around you. Reporting from the Distractology Mobile on the Plymouth South High School campus, I'm Brian Sullivan for PCN. Brian, that was such an interesting story. And as the parent of two now in their 20s, um, young adults who I had to go through this whole process with them, I remember having to tell them the biggest thing now you have to watch for is the front of the car coming towards you because you see it all the time drifting into your lane because of this. Oh yeah, it was crazy and I mentioned in the story on my way into the parking lot, there was a, and this is an adult, by the way, on her phone, totally cut me, totally cut me off. Yeah. And this is inches away. <laughs> I thought it was ironic and kind of sad and scary and funny all at the same time. Right. No, it's, it's not funny, though. It's, no. it's really getting to be a huge problem. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really glad you did this story, and I hope people take heed of the message. Definitely. Representatives from National Grid and Eversource were on hand at Pembroke Library last month for an energy forum. Hosted by Representative Josh Cutler, the forum was designed for residents to get answers to frequently asked questions about energy costs and energy policy. PCN was there to learn more. If you want to write it down the index card, you can do so now. Just raise your hand and get Rick's attention. He'll bring it up to me. So tonight we have an energy forum here in Pembroke. We're bringing in uh, experts from all of our local utilities. We have uh, Eversource, National Grid. Columbia Gas and uh, also folks from the Department of uh, Energy Resources from the state. And the idea here is just to talk about, to answer people's questions about energy costs and energy regulations, energy policy. Um, you know, we're heading into the winter, everyone's concerned about their energy bills, what they can do, you know, are they going to go up, are they going to go down, what they can do to try to keep them from going up. Um, and so tonight's uh, just a, 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 an opportunity to get everyone's questions answered and also to, to learn how we might be able to, to reduce our energy costs and, and try to save homeowners on their, on their bills this winter.
So I hope that our audience members leave here today knowing everything they ever wanted to know about energy pricing and how it works, what the difference between distribution charges are versus uh, generation charges, and that they can then become educated and spread the word so that everyone can be smart energy consumers. So in addition to what we're learning about tonight, there are a lot of great resources out there to help folks who may need a little extra helping hand this winter. The South Shore Community Action Council has a number of programs, uh, home, he home heating oil assistance and weatherization programs. And myself and Senator DiMacito, who's our senator here uh, in Pembroke, we're both here and available and our offices are, are ready to help people if they need, if they need help. So please don't be uh, shy about reaching out. But we've been asked by Representative Cutler to come out and um, give some brief information on what our job entails and what we do with the company and how it affects the, the residents that will be coming out tonight. Um, my background is in customer relations and also um, how, to, how to be able to look at the bill and determine what part of the bill goes with, with what distribution utility company or what goes with the supplier. Well, the, the big part is for everybody to understand the difference in the bill. Um, there always seems to be a little bit of confusion on the bill now because there's two different portions of the bill. So if I can help explain that to a few people, that, that's great. We also want to make sure that everybody is aware that there are plenty of energy efficiency programs and they are available for residential customers. Following the kids around the house and, and shutting the lights off when they, uh, when they leave them on, but it's, um, you know, maybe it's that second refrigerator that you have out in the garage that you don't need on for the, the winter time um, that you can shut off. Um, maybe it's having lights on a timer so that they'll come on and off and they won't be on all the time. Or even switching out to LEDs or compact fluorescents throughout the house. So I'm uh, you know, honored that Representative Cutler asked me to come out tonight and uh, I hopefully at the end of the night the residents that come out will have a better understanding of their electric bill. Unless you bought your home from a family member who had built the house and lived in it before selling it to you, you probably have no relation to the previous owner. But what if you were able to trace your lineage and the original owner of your home all the way back to the Mayflower to find out that you were cousins? That was the case for Holly Safford when she and her husband purchased the Windsor House Inn in Duxbury. The Windsor House Inn in Duxbury is representative of a time when the Pilgrims were branching out from Plymouth to the towns that might now be considered the original suburbs. The community is passionate about its historical roots and its connection to the original pilgrims. And many of the homes up and down Washington Street, which is our main thoroughfare, um, were owned by descendants of the, of the pilgrims. As you make your way inside the Windsor House, it's easy to feel like you stepped back in time a couple of hundred years, whether it's the rustic two-sided fireplace in the dining room or the quaint pub towards the back of the house with the low lighting. Whatever it is, owner Holly Safford considers herself very lucky for having bought this property with her husband. For 20 years, Holly Safford had always found herself drawn to the Windsor House in Duxbury. Now two and a half years into owning this place, it turns out there may have been something even more powerful that attracted her to this inn on Washington Street. The previous owners had a lot of treasures, and as we sifted through and tossed most of them out, one of the greatest things that we did receive was a family tree and on it we saw the names of John Alden and Priscilla Mullins from whom I'm also descended and we are descended from the eldest daughter Elizabeth. Upon further inspection and research it turns out that the lineage that connected her family to the Aldens came full circle and connected her with the family for whom this house was named. The Windsor house was in the Windsor family for many many years and in 1933 a gentleman came and opened it as a restaurant and an inn and it ran successfully, and two and a half years ago, my family bought it. And we are absolutely um, enthralled with this notion that we are actually distant cousins of the original family that owned the property, the Windsors. They are descended from John and Priscilla Alden, and I am descended from John and Priscilla Alden. And my mother did the research, and uh, when we came here and saw the family tree and realized the connection, we were ecstatic. For PCN at the Windsor House in Duxbury, I'm Brian Sullivan. It's that time of year again when television stations all over the dial start playing It's a Wonderful Life. For those of us who may not get a chance to see it on TV or would rather see it in person, the Americana Theatre Company is putting on a live radio play at Plymouth Center for the Arts. The play will run on December 3rd, 5th and 6th 
as well as the 11th through the 13th on the following weekend. We stopped over to the Arts Center to see a rehearsal for this really unique production. It's a Wonderful Life is a timeless story. We could have it in the middle of August and probably still perform to a full house of people who love it. I feel like a bootlegger's wife. <laughs> so you're fine uh, radio plays, while traditionally clearly performed on the radio, have of late made a resurgence in live theater, where an audience gets to see a performance as if it was a radio play, but they get to watch the Foley and they get to watch all the different actors portraying the different voices and different characters. So it adds a, a new element to, instead of just listening to it, you have a, a visual representation of what's going on back there. It's kind of based on a, an old school comedia where you have your lead character stays the same, but all of the characters surrounded by him are played by the same person, the, the clown in a traditional theater sense. And we've got some incredibly talented actors who, uh, who have voiceover experience with novels, who've, uh, who've done cartoon work as well. And they're able to bring to life all of the people surrounding the central character. So the audience still has a traditional focal point of uh, George Bailey, of your lead character. And Mary stays fairly consistent as well. But this incredible menagerie of actors around him is, is just three people. And uh, we've got talent right here from uh, from the Plymouth and Carver area. Jesse Sullivan, George Bailey, is originally from Plymouth. Um, born, raised here, and now is uh, lucky enough to be the artistic director of a theater company right here in Plymouth. Uh, Aaron Friday, the educational director, also uh, originally from the Plymouth area, now currently residing in Carver, but uh, keeping it a local affair. People love holiday plays. People love It's a Wonderful Life, and it's a story about remembering the reason why we're here and all the lives that we touch in the meantime. And I think that sometimes we need a reminder, and especially in this society where everything's digital and everything's on our phone and on our iPad and on our email, to remember that the moments we talk to another person, the, the times that we give whatever we have at the bottom of our pocket, they, they pay off in the long run. And this story reminds us all of that at a, at a time we could all use some reminding. For those of us that live around here, we know that Plymouth has some great eateries and fascinating history. From the pilgrims breaking bread with the Wampanoags to our own kitchen table with friends and family. Personal histories are made every day around meal gatherings. This was the concept behind Gustafson's three and a half hour food tour, bringing people together for food and friends in historic downtown Plymouth. PCN met up with one of their last tour groups of the season to learn a little bit more. We've created this tour which is about 75% food and beverage tastings and 25% sightseeing. So we really try to, to create a, a well-rounded experience in downtown Plymouth that will appeal to both locals and tourists. Um, visitors will get six different food and beverage tastings along with an assortment of, of, of sightseeing. This has been Pilgrim Food Tour's first season and it has been a wonderful experience meeting people from all over the world. Today we happen to have people here from London, England, and they uh, learned about our tour and have come from Boston. They rented a car to come on the tour and uh, are having a wonderful time. Our participants are having Buzzard's Brew. Buzzard's Brew is made from pineapple, carrots, apples, oranges, and turmeric. It's a wonderful drink that all of our food tour participants have enjoyed and many have said that it's the first time they've been to a juice bar and they are thinking about actually buying themselves a juicer because it's just they've had such a wonderful time coming here to Vela. We stop by Pilgrim Hall Museum on our tour because we kind of feel like that's a, a must for anyone who's visiting Plymouth. There's just such an amazing assortment of, of artifacts from the Pilgrims. Uh, we also stop by the Art Guild. That's just a really, really nice local cultural center. And now that the weather is getting a little bit chillier, we've actually been stopping in for 10, 15 minutes during the tour so that people can see the amazing art that, that local artists have created. And it's free for the public to go to. 
Our visitors have an assortment of wings at Speedwell. They are known for their wings. They have over 20 different flavors. And so we try to just give them a couple of different selections. One with a sauce, one with a dry rub, so they can really see what Speedwell is all about. This is the end, end of our season. We are busiest during the summer. Warm weather, of course, brings people, brings all the visitors, visitors in. I'm from Cambridge in England and we're over here visiting my son at MIT and I found the tour online and I just thought it'd be a great way to look around Plymouth. I'm with my parents and my father's quite old, he's nearly 89 and the food tour has been fantastic because he loves to walk but he can't walk too far. So stopping for food and having a little bit of history being told and our lady, the tour lady has been fantastic, very, very welcoming. Um, it's been a really good day. We went to the Pilgrim Hall Museum. It was very, very interesting. Um, I think we probably had, f had fallen foul of all the myths about the pilgrims and it was actually nice to find out what had really happened. I think that we really have put a lot of effort into creating a tour that creates a well-round experience that visitors and locals will both enjoy. It's something that does not exist any in, in anything else that you can do in Plymouth. <laughs> Our pet adoption highlight is back with two dogs up for adoption, as well as an important anniversary event for the Friends of the Plymouth Pound. Today we are celebrating our fourth anniversary at the uh, Kingston Collection. We've been here four years um, at this location and we're very happy. We've met so many wonderful adopters and we have so many great volunteers and this is a celebration of, of all of them and hopefully also we can find some homes for our other cats and dogs that are still waiting. So we really enjoy this day. We have musicians who volunteer their time and the volunteers are here running raffles and they've made food and, and we usually get a pretty good crowd. So. This is Jasper. Jasper is one and a half years old, although he's more like six months acting. Um, he is a sweet dog. He loves other dogs. He is a little bit of a puppy still, so cats are um, toys to him. And my cats, he's my foster dog, so they are, you know, a little frustrated with him, but he is great with everybody he meets. He loves kids. He would require a fence yard because he does love to run, but um, we would love to find him a great home. Hi, this is Louie. We uh, estimated Louie to be four years old. Uh, Louie has come miles. He's a very affectionate. He's good with the my other dog. He's good with the cats. Loves going for walks, full of energy, and is well behaved. Uh, I got nothing but good things to say about him. We feel that people should always consider adoption. If they're, if they're thinking about bringing a cat or dog into their home, they should check with their local shelters first to see what type of animals are available. They would be amazed at the dogs and cats waiting. If they're looking for a certain breed, there are breed rescues for each, usually each breed. So there's really no reason to purchase a pet in this day and age. So we're hoping that people will come and adopt. Once again, we welcome humorist Loretta LaRoche to the set for her Get a Life segment. Welcome, Loretta. Thank you. You are going to talk today about the holiday season and all the stressors and all the things that go wrong with our lives. So take it away. Well, it's interesting that it's called holiday stress. I've been interviewed over the years and numerous times in magazines and TV, and they always ask me, how are people going to get through their holiday stress? That's an oxymoron. A holiday is a place where you relax, where you enjoy. You know, listen to some of the, the, the songs, Joy to the, the World. world. Yep. And, you know, all the religious uh, concepts are about enjoying the holiday season. But we've made it into a consumer-driven mentality. You know, you have to go to shopping, to shop till you drop. What does that mean? I don't know. I don't know how many bodies I've seen in the mall from <laughs> shop till you drop. 
it isn't always about giving something that costs you time and money. And it's that's what stuff. we've done. It's always yeah. about stuff. And I remember when I watched, you know, the kids when they were little and other kids opening and tearing open presents yeah. And, yeah. and stuff, all, all kinds of things made yeah. out of plastic <laughs> and who knows what, <laughs> pony bears, and I don't know what they were. Yeah. I still remember my toys. Yeah. I got a couple. That was it. And they yeah. lasted for years. Yeah. My and they mother, meant the world to you. Yeah. My yeah. mother would never have bought all this stuff. So how do we get here? Why, why are we a society that is so amped up on I the holidays? I think holiday? it's about filling the emptiness that a lot of people feel that they don't think they, they can fill themselves and I understand presents, you know, don't get me wrong, folks. I think it's lovely to get a little gift here and there. Sure. But it's not about multiple gifts surrounding the house that right. are going to go on a, in a yard sale eventually. Yeah. And it starts early in August. We are inundated with, yeah. you know, first it's the Halloween with dead people in the yards and pumpkins <laughs> and everything and lights all over. Now we have pumpkin lights. <laughs> then it transitions into this other thing. And Thanksgiving is just Thanksgiving. Yeah, hey, forget heck, it. heck with that. Yeah, you know, right. You know, somebody right. should light up turkeys. Yeah. I, I mean, put lights in the turkeys. Right. But it's much more than that, folks. It really is. It's. It's, it's a holiday that should be appreciated for not only its religious connotations, yep. if that's your nature, mm -hmm. but for the idea of what it means to give and receive. Okay. So what, would, what do you suggest, well, rather than giving Johnny, you know, 12 toys? And I, and I also want to say that it's a time that people really sometimes grieve over lost loved ones. Yeah. And the, and the problems, may, they may have dysfunctional relatives or, or friends or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it brings up a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's an emotional time. So you, ha you have to sort of think about that, too. How can you handle that so it doesn't influence your joy? Yeah. But my concept is, first and foremost, I would like to think about how you can give and receive and have long-term benefits. Mm -hmm. One thing is to send a letter of gratitude to someone who has been influential in your life, who okay. has loved you and perhaps you've loved them back or they've made that difference in your life. Mm -hmm. Have it framed. Give it to them so they have it somewhere and they can see it all the time. Yep. Or read it to them in person. Right. There is actual health benefits to your immune system from doing this, from doing the person nice. who gives it right. and the person who receives it. Secondly, create some experiences. Yeah. Take you know, them somewhere. Take them somewhere and, and, and do it with them so that they get the benefit of a memory. Yes, See, so much better. A, a memory in a box doesn't last that long. Right, Unless right. it's a huge diamond ring. Right. <laughs> yeah, we like those. Those are good. Yeah, those are good. You know, it, has, it can be simple. It can be sublime to the ridiculous. Right. If you can afford it, you know, buy him a Maserati and go for a yeah, ride. Right. But most of us can't do that. So maybe it's a, it's a lunch and a movie. Or maybe it's just hanging out together yeah. and doing a craft together. But I remember most of the time, I remember the things I did with my grandmother mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. during Christmas, yep. which is, was mm -hmm. simply making a meal together. Yeah, or making ornaments for a tree Or by making hand. an ornament, yeah. right. A stringing yeah. popcorn. Yep, absolutely. Or cranberries or whatever. Absolutely. Those things stay with you for life. They do. And they have so many connotations, you know, whether it's to bring up the joy that you had with a person, right? Or uh, once again, it's a health benefit. All, right. We are the loneliest society in the world, and we think we can fill that loneliness with, with stuff. buying stuff. Okay, and we can't. And then the other thing is a gift of altruism. <laughs> okay, to give to just to, give. to give for don't, no other reason but to give in, in lieu of the person and give it to them. Now okay. they might not like all this, but hey, hey, too bad. Volunteer, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so we will we will try to have experiences for Christmas and for holidays and not be so tied to how many gifts we have on the list. I don't think we need all those that stuff. Do I you? don't either. No, I don't. You know. And next time we'll talk about something else that's stressing us out. You're not a pharaoh. You're not going to be buried with your stuff. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. Well, thank you very much, Loretta. You're welcome, and have a wonderful holiday. You too, and thank you for watching. Replay times are listed at packtv.org, and we're on YouTube. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for previews and links to all of our stories. We'll see you next week for more PAC-TV community news.